Hey, how you doing? So today's topic is descending tracks. Let's get started. All right, let's start with today's topic that is descending tracks. Before we start descending tracks, let us take a look at different types of tracks. So tracks can be classified as two, either ascending tracks or descending tracks. Let us understand them with the help of a diagram. So for example, if this is your brain and this is your spinal cord, let's make it a bit thicker. This is your spinal cord and these are your muscle fibers. group of muscle fibers all of the nerve fibers arising from the muscle fibers going to the brain are called as ascending tracts these are all called as ascending tracts whereas those tracts that originate in the brain and supply the muscle fibers these are called as descending tracts so ascending tracts are all motor in sen- sensory in nature ascending tracts are sensory in nature and all descending tracts are motor in nature however there are a few exceptions to the rule that this all descending tracts are motor in nature and that statement itself is false because there are certain tracts that have sensory function as well so which are those tracts the cerulo spinal tract and the raphia spinal tract these two tracts apart from having some motor function also have sensory function all right that are descending tracts and the exception to the rule that mo- descending tracts are motor in nature now let us take a look at a overview of the path of the descending tracts so descending tracts originate in the brain so which part of the brain they originate in the motor cortex they or- after originating in the motor cortex they have two pathways they either go to the spinal cord directly they'll go to the spinal cord directly or they'll take a halt in the mid brain and then they will go to the spinal cord after going to the spinal cord they will go to the muscle fibers all right so this is the overview of the path of the motor descending tracts now let us look at the motor cortex in detail because it is very important as it gives origin to the descending tracts so in this diagram we see the motor cortex this photo is take has an orientation of the suprolateral side of the brain so this photograph is taken in such a way that you can see the suprolateral side of the brain all right to understand any diagram we need to have a reference point so reference point in this diagram is the central sulcus the per the la- area that have marked in purple over here that is the central sulcus and the area anterior to the central sulcus that is given in red is the primary motor cortex all right and the area that is even anterior to the primary motor cortex this region this is called as the pre motor cortex and the area that is superior to the pre motor cortex is called as the supplementary motor cortex all right so now let us understand how are these three parts different from each other to understand that we'll take a look at an example that the man is standing over here and he needs to pick up a textbook that is lying in front of him on a table so what will the person do the person will walk towards the table and then he will pick the textbook up so before all of this motor function is performed so before this motor action is performed the brain will think the brain will imagine all of that actions taking place and will imagine and compute all the muscles that will be required to move it so all of this is done in the pre motor cortex because it is done before the action is performed before the action is performed the brain will think how will the action be performed and what all muscles will be required to do so so all of this planning will be done in the pre motor cortex so after all of this planning is done the plan will be sent to the primary motor cortex and the primary motor cortex has just one function that is execution so it will execute the movements that are planned by the pre motor cortex so this is how the any motor action is performed in a body it is always planned in the pre motor cortex and then they are sent to the primary motor cortex to be executed all right 
so now look at let's look at the third part of the motor cortex that is supplementary motor cortex now supplementary cort motor cortex is a phylogenetically older part so it is related to functions that were useful in the ancient times so for example actions like climbing they are controlled by the supplementary motor cortex the actions or the movements of the hips while walking on all four limbs that is controlled by the supplementary motor cortex so that is the motor cortex for you the primary motor cortex the premotor cortex and supplementary motor cortex the functions of each part of the motor cortex and how they are integrated to perform a task now let us have a look purely at descending tracts so descending tracts can be classified as two they are either pyramidal or extra pyramidal and now how are the on what basis is the classification done so the classification is done on the basis of their location in the medulla oblongata all right to understand that let's have a look at this diagram over here so this is the anterior view of the brain stem and this is the spinal cord this is the medulla oblongata and this is the pons so let us take a look purely at the medulla in this medulla you can see that there are a few raised regions so this and this this is these are two raised regions in the medulla and these raised regions are called as the pyramids all right so all of those nerve fibers that pass through the pyramids these are called as pyramidal tracts and those that do not pass through the pyramids are called as the extra pyramidal tract all right so that is pyramidal and extra pyramidal now which tracts are included in the pyramidal tracts the cortico spinal tract the cortico spinal tract are included in the pyramidal tracts now let us have a look at the cortico spinal tract so before understanding any diagram we need to have a bit of an orientation so so this part is the coronal section of the brain whereas these parts these are the spine sorry these are the cross sections of the spinal cord these are the cross sections of the spinal cord now as a thumb rule before we start any tracts we need to have some kind of an orientation of how to write an answer on the tract so the answer of the of any tracts need to include four major things the origin of the tract the course of the tract the termination of the tract and the function of the tract so now we'll look at all four of these parts in detail origin so as i told you that the cortico spinal tract or rather any descending tracts originate in the motor cortex so which part of motor cortex they originate from two parts of the motor cortex the premotor cortex and the primary motor cortex 30% of the tract originate in the pre 30% originate in the primary motor cortex so this accounts for the 60% of the tracts so now from where do the other 40% originate the other and the remaining 40% originate in the somatosensory region they all originate in the sorry they all originate in the somatosensory region now from from so let me tell you why do they originate in the somatosensory region now to perform any motor action you need to have some sensory inputs as well because the senses tell you where an object is placed for example in that uh, previous example i told you that a person has to pick the textbook up so now how will he know where the textbook is placed he'll know that by looking at it so sensory inputs are important to understand how far needs the hand the hand needs to be moved how far do you need to walk all of those are decided by the inputs from the sensory impulses that is why sensory impulses are important in deciding motor functions that is why 40% of the tracts originate in the somatosensory area now after originate so all right so let us have a look at premotor cortex in a bit more depth because it is important and there are certain cells present over here that are important so the primary motor cortex has something known as the bets cell now why are these cells important because these cells give rise to large myelinated nerve fibers 
all the large myelinated nerve fibers of the corticospinal tracts are from bed cells whereas all the other tracts all the other nerve fibers originating in the premotor primary motor and somatosensory area have smaller diameters and bed cells comprise to about 3% of the tracts all right now after originating in the motor cortex they move down and exit via the posterior limb of internal capsule this part is the posterior limb of internal capsule now why is this important because posterior limb of internal capsule is associated with an artery known as charcot's artery and this artery is a branch of the middle cerebral artery and this artery is the most common cause of intracerebral hemorrhage 60% of the intracerebral hemorrhages can be accounted for due to charcot's artery now if there is a hemorrhage in the charcot's artery and the posterior limb of internal capsule is occluded there will be a lesion in the corticospinal tract and we will see the functions of corticospinal tracts as impaired functions so that is why charcot's artery is important now after exiting from the posterior limb of internal capsule they move down in the midbrain and the pons in the medulla and as we saw earlier that they form the pyramids in the medulla in the lower part of the medulla now they do something very different they cross over to the other side some of the fibers most of the fibers cross over to the other side and some of the fibers go down straight now what is this crossover called this crossing over is called as decussation the tract decussate all right now after decussation due to decussation there are two types of tracts now they are either anterior corticospinal tract or they are lateral corticospinal tract all of those nerve fibers that cross over and go down they form the lateral corticospinal tract whereas those tracts that move down ipsilaterally that is on the same side they form the anterior corticospinal tract so from this diagram it's clear that as and as the name suggest that the corticospinal tract that terminate on the that cross over and terminate on the lateral side whereas those that do not cross over they pass down ipsilaterally and terminate on the anterior side now after terminating and a few of the association neurons that are present over here they connect these corticospinal tracts to other nerve fibers that originate in the spinal cord and go to the muscles so after terminating on the spinal cord new group of nerve fibers arise that take the impulses from the corticospinal tract to the muscles with this we complete the origin course and termination what is the origin the motor cortex premotor primary motor and somatosensory area the course is it exits in this so it exits from the posterior limb of internal capsule it goes down in uh, same side in the midbrain pons and medulla and medulla they form the pyramids in the lower part of the medulla they decussate to the other side and therefore forming two different types of corticospinal tracts anterior corticospinal tracts and lateral corticospinal tract the anterior corticospinal tract terminates on the anterior aspect of spinal cord the lateral corticospinal tract terminates on the lateral aspect of spinal cord after terminating they give off new nerve fibers the spinal cord gives off new nerve fibers that carry impulses from the corticospinal tract to the muscles now we move on to the function what function what group of muscle fibers are affected the distal group of muscle fibers are affected so what are the distal group they are the hands fingers and everything so what do the hands and fingers control they all control the fine movements fine movements like drawing painting writing all of those are controlled by corticospinal tract and apart from the control of fine movements they also control the muscles of speech so the speech muscles are also controlled by the corticospinal tract so this is the function the origin the cause the termination of corticospinal tract now we move on to the clinical aspect now this is also very important in exam if you want good marks almost near full marks you need to have in clinical aspect in every answer that you write all right so now as i told you that over here in the internal posterior limb of internal capsule charcot's artery is associated if there is a lesion due to the hemorrhage of charcot's artery what will happen due to the hemorrhage of charcot's artery the lesion will produce certain changes so what changes will be seen for obvious reasons the fine movements will be lost 
fine movements will be lost because the corticospinal tract control fine movements and a lesion in corticospinal tract will lead to a loss of function of corticospinal tract causing the loss of fine movements in a corticospinal tract lesion gross movements are not very markedly affected okay since they do not control the gross movements the gross movements are not affected now how do you identify if a person has a corticospinal tract lesion clinically to identify that we have a special test or a sign that is known as the babinski's sign the babinski's sign now what is babinski sign in babinski sign you stroke the media you stroke the lateral aspect of the foot sole of the foot so that means the, for example if this is your foot this is the median aspect this is the lateral aspect now if you stroke the lateral aspect of your foot there will be a reflex action seen so what will the normal reflex action be the normal reflex action would be plantar flexion all right but if a person has corticospinal tract lesion you will see a different kind of reflex action the different reflex action that will be seen is fanning of toes you will see fanning of toes and with that you will see the extension of the great toe all right so now why does this happen now let us take a look at the normal scenario the corticospinal tracts they control the muscles of the foot along with corticospinal tract certain extra pyramidal tracts also exert a very small influence on the foot now extra pyramidal tracts have a function that is a bit rudimentary and they have a withdrawal reflex so whenever a foot is stroked they will lead and extra pyramidal tracts will cause the withdrawal reflex whereas the corticospinal tract will cause a higher reflex that is plantar flexion and since corticospinal tracts is a higher function our brain decides that it will follow corticospinal tract and not extra pyramidal tract therefore normally corticospinal tract function takes over or overrides extra pyramidal tracts withdrawal reflex so corticospinal tract causes plantar flexion normally but since corticospinal tract is absent the extra pyramidal tract function takes over that is a withdrawal reflex takes over and the withdrawal reflex will cause the fanning of toes and extension of great toe so that is what babinski sign is and that is why babinski sign is seen in corticospinal tract lesion now there is one more important point that i would like to mention over here that clinically pure lesions pure corticospinal tract lesions are very rare why is that pure corticospinal tract lesions are rare because you will see ahead that the extra pyramidal tracts are very closely associated with the pyramidal tracts so if there is a lesion affecting pyramidal tract it is bound that the corticospinal tract along with extra pyramidal tracts will be affected it is very rare to have pure pyramidal tract lesions and where do we so how do we know that pyramidal tract lesions will cause babinski sign because they are all performed only in the experimental animals they are only seen in experimental animals not in real life clinical scenarios they are extremely rare all right so with this we complete the pyramidal tracts okay so that is all for today's topic i hope it made sense to you i hope you have understood the concepts so you can go back to the book and refer the topic and i hope it will make much more sense to you thank you for watching